Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Paris Schutz. Brandis Friedman is on assignment. On the show tonight. Does it help with memory function? Maybe. A controversial new drug to treat Alzheimer's disease wins conditional approval by a torn FDA panel. I'm looking forward to the work that this commission does to present a map that truly reflects the diversity of Chicago. A new commission wants to redraw boundaries for Chicago's 50 wards, but not everybody's on board. The new head of the Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum on the legendary president's significance and telling the story of African Americans. Go to your interview with your braids. Go to work in your braids. And the art of hair braiding and why it's more than just a hairstyle. But first, some of today's top stories. Mayor Lori Lightfoot is defending the city's summer violence prevention strategy. Lightfoot made these comments at an unrelated event opening a new grocery store today. She says crime is trending downward from the beginning of this year, even as Chicago has reported more homicides and shootings so far in 2021 compared to this point last year. Many of the people that are being shot are being shot by people who look just like them, similar age, and so this whole of government approach that we're taking to public safety to really focus on those most dangerous areas in our city, the 15 beats, four zones, um, a lot of that work is focused around supporting young people and their families because we know, unfortunately, they are the drivers of a lot of this violence. 55 people were shot over the weekend and five were killed. Illinois health officials report more than 300 new cases today with 11 new deaths. That brings the total number of coronavirus cases to nearly 1.4 million with 22,974 deaths statewide since the pandemic began. And the state says 11.7 million vaccinations have been administered to this point with a daily average of about 43,000 shots. A key city panel supports opening a boys and girls club at a controversial police academy currently under construction on Chicago's west side. Today's vote by the Community Development Commission sends the proposal to City Council's Housing and Real Estate Committee, which could then advance it to the full City Council later this month. The $95 million Police and Fire Academy has long been opposed by police reform advocates who are calling for the funds to instead be invested in schools and other city services. The new facility is expected to be completed by the fall of 2022. It's the big news in the medical world. Alzheimer's has its first new treatment in 18 years. The Food and Drug Administration recently granted conditional approval to a new drug that treats the root of the disease. But the FDA's conditional approval has been controversial. So why did the agency approve it? And does the drug actually work? Here now with more is Dr. Concetta Forchetti, a neurologist and the medical director of the Amida Health Neurosciences Institute Center for Memory Disorders. She ran the study here for the newly approved Alzheimer's drug, and she has no financial interest in the drug or the drug company. And Dr. Marcel Mesulam, a professor of neurology and neuroscience at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine, where he is also the director of the Mesulam Center for Cognitive Neurology and Alzheimer's Disease. Welcome both of you to Chicago tonight. Dr. Forchetti, I'll start with you. Since you have been uh, on this study for 10 years, this is the first new drug for Alzheimer's in nearly two decades. What exactly does it do? Well, as probably Dr. Mesolam can tell you better than myself, if we believe in the amyloid hypothesis and the cascade hypothesis as a cause of Alzheimer's disease, what this drug does binds to the amyloid, which is a, a protein that is not well metabolized as we age, precipitates in between the cells, forms plaque, causes a lot of disruption uh, in the brain tissue. We don't know how triggers another protein, which is called the tau, which forms the tangles, and then the tangles will kill brain cells, and the death of brain cells ultimately causes the symptoms that we see in patients when they come to our office with cognitive decline. So if we believe in this hypothesis, what this drug does removes the beta amyloid from the brain, prevents the formation of plaque, and should 
halt or reduce the cascade and the, the tau formation and therefore cells death. And given this, Dr. Masula, the FDA was torn on this conditional approval. Can you explain the controversy here? So as Dr. Forchetti said, the drug was designed to remove amyloid from the brain. And actually in clinical trials, it did that beautifully. But obviously, the reason why you want to clear amyloid from the brain is so that there will be a clinical effect, that either there's going to be some improvement clinically or that the clinical worsening will be slowed down. That part is where the problem lies because the evidence that the company provided is just simply not convincing. So what would be the point to clean your brain from amyloid if it doesn't have an effect that the patient can experience or the family detect? Dr. Forchetti, so, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. So what Dr. Forchetti, so, so uh, what did you find when you did that study? That, yes. that Did you find significant improvement in patients? Yes, I have patients. Actually, my site was the number one enroller in the world in the number of patients. They were randomized to the drug 10 years ago. So many of them have received the real drug for now 10 years. And it is true that the trial was briefly interrupted last March because the initial statistical analysis did not show a statistical significance. When the data were re-examined and they looked only at the very mild patients who were given the highest dose of the drug, which is 10 milligrams per kilogram, they found a significant delay in decline. My personal experience, which is personal, is not statistically significant, is that those patients that I've been following for 10 years, they are still doing well. They are still, some of them are still driving. They are still doing their activity of daily living. And I've been following these patients every month and every three months with cognitive testing. All right, D D Dr. It, Dr. Masula, is there a downside here for this conditional approval given that there is disagreement in the medical and scientific community uh, and could it hinder further uh, studies uh, w for Alzheimer's treatments? Well, if the evidence for clinical efficacy is not believable, then, um, or at least let me say, not yet convincing enough, then how can you ask a patient to take a drug that requires hour-long infusions once a month yes. that could have side effects of bleeds in the brain and swelling in the brain, and that is going to be costing a fortune? And, and Dr. Forchetti, uh, and that cost, we would presume, oh. mostly would be picked up by Medicare, so it would be uh, yeah. public money because it would affect uh, folks that are on me Medicare. So what about those concerns, about the side effects, about the costs? I am very concerned about the cost. Um, I don't want to get into politics, but I don't share the politics that some company get the gain and then we pay for the benefit. Um, I have to say that the bleeds were only micro bleeds, meaning microscopic. They were minimal. They didn't cause any problem. The edema, the vasogenic edema was only in 50% of the patient. It resolved without any significant side effect, but the study was controlled. We follow those patients very closely. So I am concerned about what is going to happen when this drug is going to be available in the general public. All right. And and concern about the cost. Dr. Masula, should the public have some skepticism with the FDA here, given that they did approve this despite their advisory committee recommending against it, and despite the fact that the drug manufacturer Biogen stands to make lots of money for itself and for its shareholders here, given this approval? It's a leap of faith, and it's a conditional approval, and it's going to lead to a large post-approval trial which hopefully is going to bring the necessary rigor to the clinical efficacy. And from then on, everybody will be the winner. But in the meantime, if that is not the case, then uh, we're going to have a lot of individuals who are indefinitely on hour-long infusions 
that have no clinical benefit, and that would be a big problem. So, so more to study. We only have a couple seconds, Dr. Forchetti. Just very quickly, who do you recommend this for? At what stage of the disease? Well, first of all, I share Dr. Asulam concerns. I would recommend it only to patients in the very early stages of dementia and who are very healthy who don't have any other significant medical problem. All right, we're going to have to keep following this. Our thanks to Dr. Conchetta Forchetti and Dr. Marcel Masulam for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And up next, the latest on a new map for Chicago's wards, so please stay with us. Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight Black Voices. What do you believe prevents a strong coalition of black and Latino communities forming across the communities? I want us to, as a nation, to find a way to come together. Go down the block, get it from someone local, and keep the money in the community. Black joy in the black experience is magical. The Illinois House and Senate have new legislative maps, so Chicago is next, and a new commission says it wants to redraw the 50 wards to better reflect the city's diversity. But not everyone's on board. WTDW News reporter Heather Sharon joins us now with more. All right, Heather, a new commission out there to redraw Chicago's wards. What is their goal? Well, this is a commission put together by a coalition of community groups who wanted an independent commission to draw this next map for the Chicago City Council. But after it became clear that Mayor Lightfoot and the City Council weren't really interested in giving up that power, they decided to take matters into their own hand. And now the commission is up and running and they're starting their work. So Mayor Lightfoot, like Governor Pritzker, did talk about wanting fair maps. Why is she not on board with this? Well, there's a lot of pushback from both the Latino caucus and the Black caucus who are concerned that an independent commission would dilute their power on the city council. This remap is going to be very, very fraught because as we've seen Chicago's Black population decrease, we've seen the Latino population increase, and there's going to be a lot of jockeying for power on the city council as we go forward. And what's, what's next for this commission then? Well, we're still waiting for census data. We typically have that by now so that everybody could get to work. So the question is, much like at the state level, will the city council use preliminary data and, get, and estimates to start drawing these maps, or will they wait? The deadline is December 1st, whether to see there could be enough votes to send it to referendum. The remap fight always contentious. I remember 10 years ago at city council, the quintessential backroom deal, and one of the top criteria was simply to end the career of two aldermen that the rest of them didn't like very much. All right, always interesting. Heather, thank you so much. Thanks, Paris. And you can read Heather's full story on our website. That's WTTW.com slash news. And now to Phil Ponce and the new leader of an institution celebrating one of America's presidents. Phil. Paris, for more than a decade and a half, the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum has worked to tell the story of the nation's 16th president. It's both a research library for scholars and an educational institution open to the public. Recent years have been a little bumpy, though, with the departure of a state historian and executive director and debates over the authenticity of a high-profile artifact, a stovepipe hat. Today marks a new era for the institution. It's the first day on the job for its new executive director. Joining us now is that new leader, Christina Schutt. She's a Missouri native and was most recently director of the Mosaic Templars Cultural Center in Little Rock, Arkansas, which celebrates African-American history and culture. Christina Schutt, welcome to Illinois. How was your first day at work? It was excellent. I got to meet with some of the staff today as well as welcome busloads of visitors um, and school children that we've had uh, visiting us. So it was a great first day. You grew up in a family that valued learning deeply. Uh, tell us about uh, tell us about that family culture. Absolutely. Uh, in our family, education was and is the way in which um, we've not only bettered ourselves, but helped better our community. And, um, you know, 
someone who, who understood that quite well was my grandmother, um, Frida Wright, who um, integrated uh, her, her university. And she did that because, again, she, she wanted those opportunities for herself, um, for her community, and ultimately for, for her family that would come along later. It's interesting that as an historian, I understand that there was uh, you had a teacher once who told you to uh, forget about the textbook and write your own history book. Uh, what impact did that have on you? Oh, that had a huge impact on me because it helped me understand that history is not just some faraway foreign place that we visit, but history is alive, that history is something that we can be engaged in, and that understanding our history um, helps us to understand the world in which we live in now and help us to make informed choices about the world we want to live in. So having that kind of um, hands-on history is something that I'm personally passionate about and something that I hope to, to not only really continue, but to grow here at the museum. And what attracted you in the first place to the Lincoln Library and Museum? Well, I think uh, you don't get very many opportunities to get to talk about, to reimagine, to rethink. Um, you know, someone who there's, I think, over 15,000 books <laughs> written about Lincoln. And so the opportunity to really talk about him in a fresh new way, uh, in a relevant way for our public is just hugely exciting. And so when I got the call, I immediately said yes um, at this chance. And uh, what is your vision for the uh, institution? What do you want to do? Yeah, I think um, core and central to my vision really is about um, welcoming the community, helping to really center Lincoln um, in the context of not just who he was at the time, but who he is for us today. What do Lincoln's words mean to us today? How have we tried to um, embody things like, you know, um, understanding our, our our better angels, right? Um, how do we how do we think about Lincoln, and how do we think about the impact that he had, but also um, the impact that um, those in his circle, those around him, had on him, and again, the world in which we live in today. As we mentioned, there have been some ups and downs in the museum's history. In terms of bringing stability uh, to the institution, uh, your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, all I can do is, is speak from my experience. At Mosaic Templars Cultural Center, I was the fifth director appointed there and the 14th change in leadership for the staff. And so I understand um, firsthand some of the challenges um, that are involved in, in moving forward um, with that past, but I, I think one of the things that the staff have really shown over, particularly over the pandemic in the last year, year and a half, is their willingness to, to work together, their energy and excitement to move forward. You know, even in the middle of the pandemic, um, you know, they were creating exhibits. Um, we just uh, recently opened State of Sound, and it's a fantastic exhibit, which they did in the midst of a very trying and difficult season, um, you know, not having an executive director and also uh, in the midst of, you know, a pandemic. And so uh, I think we're all ready uh, really to move forward together and to think about um, what does this museum and what can this museum mean for the community of Springfield, but also for the state of Illinois and for the nation as we think about our 16th president. One of the things that uh, we mentioned at the top of the segment was the controversy over the stovepipe hat. W just give us an update. What is the latest? Was it or was it not Lincoln's stovepipe hat that you have? Well, there um, was a report that was done, and I'm again, it's my first day, so I'm just kind of getting to scratch the surface of some of that stuff. Um, I know that there um, is kind of a committee that's working working on that, um, but you know, as always, we'll keep the public updated as um, as that information comes to light and as we learn um, that from you know textile experts uh, and people in the community. Uh, a big item going on display this month is the Juneteenth as part of the Juneteenth celebration. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah, I'm so excited that we'll be displaying um, one of the original, you know, super rare um, copy of the Emancipation Proclamation um, that, as you know quite well, um, uh, was a document that Lincoln signed that freed enslaved people um, in um, states that were in rebellion against the Union. And so uh, that was hugely important um, to our country and to um, the Civil War and the war effort. And so we'll be displaying that, but also we've got some great programming lined up that you can check our um, social media channels to find out specifics. Uh, but again, helping to interpret that, to talk about that, to talk about the relevance for people here today. I'm particularly excited about our Underground Railroad program coming up, I think, um, in the next couple weeks. So it's definitely going to be something you don't want to miss.
And you are the first African-American person to head the institution. Does that inform how you are going to approach the job in any way? Sure. Well, um, you know, I always say that when I come to work, um, I bring all my identities with me. So I bring my womanness, I bring my blackness, I bring my degrees, I bring um, all the ancestors, as we would say, in the, in the Black, um, Black History Museum community um, when I come into work. And so in terms, you know, for me, I think growing up in a situation where I didn't see myself represented in museums, I didn't see people who looked like me, um, you know, it, it's always encouraged me and inspired me to, to look around and see, well, what stories aren't being told? Um, what history hasn't been shared? And how can we bring that into our institution? How can we bring that community uh, to be a part of the museum, to be part of the story that we're telling about really American history, because that's what we're doing, right? It's not just African-American history or Latinx history or indigenous history, right? It is American history. And so how can we tell that in a bold and new way? Christina Schutt, thank you so much for spending part of your first day with us. Congratulations and all the best to you. Thank you so much. And up next, the art of hair braiding and why it's more than just a hairstyle. But first, a look at the weather. A hairstyle that was at one point used to differentiate African tribes has since grown into an art form that goes beyond a hairstyle. Arts correspondent Angel Ito introduces us to hair braider Mo G and how she's using braids to push against cultural biases that consider the look unprofessional. For decades, black women have been told their hair is only acceptable when following Eurocentric ideas and straightening it. Going back to slavery, it used to be illegal for the slaves to show their hair. It was a means to keep us down and keep us looking bad, per se. Even though, you know, your afro is still just as cute, but it still takes time to maintain any type of black hair. So I think that's why they deemed it unprofessional. That's why professional hair braider Mo G is on a mission to help them understand the beauty of their natural hair. People would cancel their braid appointments if they had an interview. And I would always say, if you can't wear braids, that's not the job that you want. Go to your interview with your braids. Go to work in your braids. Like, it's okay. From afros to locks, there are a variety of ways black women can wear their hair in its natural state without straightening it to prevent damage. But it wasn't until she was asked to be in an art show that Moji realized the intricate patterns and details within her braids were more than just a protective style. I had the braids on the wall and Sierra was like, can I put, this is art, can I like display this? And I was like, Display what? Like, what are you? What are you asking me to do? She was like, "This is art." I was like, "No, this is just the hair. This is just my hair that I took down." And shortly after that, that's when I like realized and appreciated it as an art form because just growing up and in the community, it wasn't seen as such. It was just like a trade. But it's the art form within this trade that nonprofit Urban Gateways uses as a connector to bigger issues in their ongoing conversation series, Art And, that Moji was recently a part of. This kind of series and featuring artists like Moji really embody that, that you can find art anywhere as long as you're willing to look. We see how the arts have always played a role in, um, in thinking about how we push um, new ways of thought. So how do we use the arts to convey a sense of equity, a sense of inclusion, a sense of justice? Um, it's something that is always embedded in the arts and artists can tell you that. How do we shine a light on that and how do we all think about the role we play? 
As an artist, that role for Moji will always be geared toward pushing against cultural biases to champion black women. And we have to set aside like specific days and times to make sure we can like tend to ourselves because black women always have to keep a happy face, always have to be strong. We always have to get through everything and it's like the only time you really get to kind of sit down and get pampered is when you get your hair done. And so I like giving that mom or that sister or you know, that child, that student, this opportunity where you sit down, you don't have any obligations but to sit here and just get pretty. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Angel Ito. And next up in Urban Gateway's conversation series, Art and Resistance, that's tomorrow evening. And if you're interested in learning more about the art of hair braiding, we've got a special tutorial by Moji on our website. And that is our show for this Tuesday night, abbreviated to bring you special pledge programming. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing, and you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com news. You can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. Illinois and Chicago are set to fully reopen on Friday. Our Spotlight Politics team talks about what to expect. And finding housing is hard enough without a criminal background. How a unique Cook County program is helping recovering drug addicts with a search. And now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you for watching. Stay healthy and safe. And we'll see you tomorrow. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, pleased to give back to the community through numerous charitable initiatives. This evening's presentation of Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by the Polk Brothers Foundation, working to make Chicago a place where all people have the opportunity to reach their full potential. You must take the A train. PBS is proud to present the legendary Ella Fitzgerald. Ella had a sound all her own and shared her gift for nearly six decades. Discover her life story as she stood against both racial and sexist barriers to become one of the most iconic singers of all time. Watch Ella, just one of those things. Next on WTTW. Melissa Etheridge is one of those rare live performers who knows how to engage and entertain you, making even the largest theater seem intimate. Melissa Etheridge, a little bit of me, live in L.A. Tonight at 9.30 on WTTW.